Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Today we will start with something that is causal. Until now we only talked about probability theory and there was probably nothing new. Maybe there was something new because you learned it differently, all these things, and maybe now we have a different understanding of the things you knew before, but it was all probability theory, so it was all the classical stuff that you kind of already knew. And today we will do something special and we will follow this very nice book elements of causal inference it's one of the books that i'm suggesting at the beginning from Jonas peters dominic jansing and bernard schulkopf those are former colleagues of mine in tubing and they did some really interesting works on work on causality and pushed it forward in my opinion and finally they also wrote a nice book you can also download it as a pdf completely legally from the website of the publisher so you can just get it they have their own kind of notation, which I sometimes like, sometimes I don't like. I will use them also on the slides, this notation, but I also show you the other notation that is more like from Julia Pearl style, so that you see both of them. Um, however, they have a very nice structure to their book. So they first start with causal models in the simplest case for two variables, which is like you only have a variable which is the cause and another variable which is the, which is the effect. And on this simple starting point, they explain everything that is essential. So they explain what is the structural causal model for the super simple case. They explain what are interventions. Interventions is now something that goes beyond statistics and probability theory. And then they also talk about what are counterfactual and counterfactuals in this context. And we will following their structure because it's very nice. Once we understood all these things in the simplest possible case of two variables, of course, you can easily generalize it to the multivariate settings, where instead of having two variables with an error, you might have a large directed r cyclic graph, like a large Bayesian network, which you interpret causally. And we will introduce that later. Not next time even, but I think in two weeks or something. But it will be just a repetition of what we learned today, yeah? because it's all. this is a special case of the whole thing, but it's good to learn about these things. Um, so let's start with structural causal models. So now, this should go beyond the usual description of two random variables, which is typically described as a joint distribution. So typically we have the joint distribution and that describes everything of two random variables. Now we have a different way of describing what two random variables are doing. And from this description, we can also derive a joint distribution, but we can derive many other things, okay? So let's have a look what it is. <laughs> So in a structural causal model, abbreviated SCM, in some fields it's also called structural equation models. So causality is a field which uh, is, as I explain it, it's originating, in my opinion, from computer science, from Julia Pearl, who is a computer scientist. But there's, of course, a large branch in the statistical sciences, in particular in the econometrics department. So they know a lot about causal models as well. And they talk about these things sometimes slightly different. But uh, I think everything they say can be interpreted in our framework as well. But there's a lot to learn from them. So they know, they know many more methods than we will include in the lecture. Then there's the other community, the uh, sociology department. So they also like to do experiments. They hand out questionnaires and ask for, ideally are interested also in causal relationships. If someone is unemployed, does it cause a person to do this or that, and so on and so forth. And they're also interested in these questions. So there are also some methods in those departments, typically. And of course, also epidemiology, so like in, in the biomedical areas, they're also interested in causal, rela uh, causal relations. And so there's also some theories there. So why in these applied areas? Because in the statistics department, maybe not in Dortmund, but in general, um, the, the causal models were for a long time, I think, more or less ignored, or it was something that we didn't talk about, whether one variable is causing the other. I think in classical statistics, we typically talk about the joint distribution, and that's it. And that's all we can say. And there is something attractive to it, because the joint distribution is all you can have from some observable data. So let's say you have a big table of examples, you can only estimate the joint distribution. You cannot really estimate the structural causal model in general. So there's some reason why they are kind of ignored or why they say, yeah, so causality is nice, we all want it, but it's difficult, and so it's harder. So what we are now doing is 
uh, following Julia Pearl and the book from uh, Jonas Peters and colleagues, is to define a causal model which will um, specify more than a joint distribution does. However, it might not be so easily identifiable from data. But it's a starting point to think about these things. And as it turns out, in some situations, we can also do something with data. Okay, so now what is the structural causal model for two random variables, C and E? And we call them already C like cause and E like effect, okay, to keep it even simpler. So it consists of the following three things. First of all, for each of the variables, we have an independent noise random variable, okay? So those are noise random variable. That's where something random happens. And then we have two functions, FC and FE, and they tell us how to compute C and E given the noise variables, yeah? So there are two assignments. The first one is that my random variable C is defined to be the output of the function F sub C if I input the noise, and the E, the effect, is the output if I input the noise for the effect model and the cause, okay? Um, typically, we assume that the noise variables are independent. However, later, when we talk about counterfactuals, this will be dropped. So now, what is the graphical model of this, of this one now? So let's draw it on the board. Oh, that was the wrong click. So let me try it like this and switch off the beamer. Okay. So we have a couple of new variables here. We have, is this working, this pen? I'm not sure. Do I have a better one? Maybe. <coughs> Only slightly. Okay, so I have a noise variable for the cause, I have a noise variable for the effect, and then there is the cause and the effect. And there was a function which is turning the noise into a cause, so there's an arrow going like this, okay? And then there's a function that turns the noise for the effect and the input into the E. So that would be the graphical model for our very simple structural causal model that I just showed you, okay? And basically, so the C is equal to some function F of the noise, and the E is some other function where we input the cause and its noise. So where's the randomness? The randomness is up here and here. So the noise variables are standard normal distributed or uniform or whatever. They have some random distribution. So there is a joint distribution in general, of the two noise variables. On the slide that I just showed you, I was assuming that the distributions are independent, so this thing even factorizes. But later on, they could be coupled as well. Um, then the arrows basically are deterministic functions. So this deterministic function, that deterministic function. Um, you can think of them as like mathematical functions. I like to think of them as computer programs. Yeah? So that is a computer program turning this noise into something else. However, they are deterministic. But because the input is random, the output will be a random variable too, where the distribution, of course, depends on the mapping. And now, the, the C is causing the E. So if I run my program, I would sample noise variables, and then I can compute a cause, and then I can compute an effect. And you see, depending on what I computed for the C, the effect might change. Yeah. However, if my effect changes for whatever reason, my C still has the same distribution. And so this is a structural causal model. And now the key is I can start to manipulate it. So it's a combination of this distribution up here and these two functions, basically. And I can now say this might describe some situation in nature. Uh, do I have a good story? No, I don't have a good story now. But I can manipulate it. I could, for example, cut that one off and replace it with a different mechanism, yeah? And this is typically what physicists are doing in an experiment, that they're changing things. And so I could say, okay, I can sample from nature in my experiment, but now let's say I'm, I'm modifying, I intervene, this is an intervention, I intervene on the effect by giving it a different mechanism. And then I could say, see, does my C change or not? And as it turns out, the C won't change because the recipe for the C didn't change. However, if I do an intervention on the C and would replace it with a different one, a different mechanism, 
Yeah? Then the E will also change. So the curious thing is, with this setup, I can now distinguish between cause and effect. Because if I put an intervention on my model, like modifying the mechanism for a certain random variable, either the other one is changing or the other one is not changing. Okay? We will go into more details in a second. Okay, so that is a causal model, and I need to switch on the screen. <coughs> and of course, you can already see now how could you have this more general? Okay, you have 10 random variables, fine. So you will have 10 random noise variables and you will have 10 mechanisms, so 10 functions. And then you have these 10 assignments, right, which compute the output of the random variables. And since I'm saying, so they are computer programs, these assignments as well, so you should be able to evaluate them. So it's better a directed acyclic graph than these variables. So you shouldn't input now something into it which hasn't been computed. So you should be able to compute it in a forward way, these assignments, okay? It was a directed acyclic graph. And the rest stays the same, yeah? So the generalization is kind of trivial. So more words. So the C and the E, those are the things that you want to model. Those are the observables from which you might have data, okay? And the noise variables, they are unobservables. We cannot directly measure them, okay? However, often the mechanism here is just identity, okay? And then we are directly observing the noise for the cause. But in principle, there is a mechanism and we cannot directly observe it, okay? Um, okay, C is called cause, E is effect, so far so good. And that's the causal graph, like the short version of it, where I only draw the observable variables, okay? And here we see that C is manipulating E, but E is not manipulating C. Yeah. In a Bayesian network, um, that would be also a description of the joint distribution, but it doesn't have a meaning about changing mechanisms or something. So Bayesian networks are more, um, don't have the information about the mechanisms in here. Um, as I said, C and E are, given the structural causal model, both random variables, okay, which are defined by these transformations and the noise distributions that I feed in. Good, so far so good. Let's have a nice example. So here's a nice example. Um, so suppose we have uniformly distributed noise variables. So they are both between 0 and 1, and everything is equally likely. And then we say x is just the first one, so the mechanism is the identity. And y is the sum of my x plus the other noise variable. Okay? Um, the corresponding causal graph will be, of course, x error y. And I can also write down the induced join PDF as follows. Um, so the PDF of X, which is a uniform distribution, is just this Iverson bracket between zero and one, okay? So the X is, so the result will be one between zero and one, and it's zero everywhere else, okay? Just the usual one. And the density um, for Y, yeah, which is the sum of X plus a uniform distribution, it is just the question whether Y is between X and X plus one. Okay, why is that the case? Suppose x is one half, okay? Then we know that y will be one half plus a number from zero to one. So it's between one half and 1.5 in this interval. And that's exactly what, I'm, what it's saying down here. So it must be in this interval. It also makes sense like, um, like syntactically, right? So the p of x only contains the x. The p of y given x contains the x and the y. Okay, it's conditioned on y. Uh, condition on x and so probability distribution is on y. Okay, and, and writing to write this thing down with ifs and else gets more and more complicated. So I think the notation is useful at this point already. Um, note that we can also factorize our joint distribution differently. We could also factor it with p of y and p of x given y. That's just following from the product rule. So we can have it both ways. And if I only have the joint distribution, not one of them is better than the others, so both are equally. In particular, it means that there's a second structural causal model, right? There's another one where y is the cause and x is the effect. And of course, the question now is what is p of y and what is p of x given y? What are these? Could I derive it? In principle, yes, I can derive it if I'm starting with the joint distribution like this. And here I derived it, and it looks already horribly complicated. 
And um, I will show you maybe on the board how to derive these formulas, okay? Because it's surprisingly difficult. Um, for that, let me do the switch, okay? So, um, first of all, uh, let's get more space. Oh, I really need to use this one. Okay, so let me write down what we have. We have um, a noise variable, an X, which is uniform. Okay, here I use a small n with an X, right? It's a value, and that is a random variable. And I have a similar one for, ah, okay, I should use the right letters. So this was the one for the cause, and this is the one for the effect should be also uniform. Ah, okay, so now this should be a capital E, fine. Okay, mutation is always fun. And then I say x is equal to nc, so basically it's also uniformly distributed in x, okay? The notation is a bit sloppy. And that is just the summation of these two. Let's draw it as a hist as like a yeah, histogram, or let's say we have on one axis x and on the other axis y, and let's see the 2D density, okay? So the 2D density is, it should be uniformly along x, okay? So it's like this, and along y it's a bit unclear. So um, maybe let's draw it slightly differently. So it's starting already down here, okay? I hope you can see it. So it's starting at the zero, and it's going from zero to one. Okay, great. So now, what points can I reach in this 2D thing? Suppose x is equal to zero, in principle it's possible, and then I add a uniform distribution. So in principle I could have all of these. They could be in principle sampled from zero to one, right? Now let's say I'm having one, so for one, I'm sampling from one plus zero, or one plus one. So it, it's from here up to that one. Yeah, so those values are possible. If I'm at a half, then the smallest one will be one half, and the largest one will be over there, okay? And so I'm getting kind of like a 2D shape like this. Okay, and it's uniformly distributed across the whole area. Ah, interesting. So now what about the marginal distribution? I put it on the margin for y. So it looks like in the middle there's most of it. So here's like most of the mass. And then to the side it gets smaller. Yeah, and as we will derive in a second, it will be um, of this triangular shape. Okay. So it's like linearly growing and then it's linearly decreasing again. Okay, let's try to derive that. So we are given a distribution for x and for y. So that was the p of x being equal to my Iverson brackets. And then I have a p of y given x, which was x smaller or equal in y than so y must be between x and x plus 1, okay? So I also have a joint distribution, which is the product of these two. Now what is p of y? Can someone suggest a formula for that one? How can I compute it, given the other two? Any ideas? Do you mind if I switch this thing off? The reflections are kind of bad. Is this working? Yeah. So, yeah, it's slightly better. I'm not sure. It's so dark now. Okay, I'll switch it on again. Let's take these ones. Okay. Yeah. Slightly better. So any, so now we had enough time to think. So any, any formula that comes to mind how to get the P of Y? You can say something wrong. How could I get it? It's a marginal distribution. How can I get a marginal distribution? Maybe the sum of the over x of the probability of y given x 
Exactly. I, I put a step in between. You did two, two steps at once. I use the sum rule, right? Just the joint distribution, and I need to sum out the x. That was the sum rule. Next, I do the product rule for this one to get these terms here. So I have the integration of p of x, p of y given x dx. Okay, nice. So let's do that. So p of x, if I plug in this guy in here, it's the same as saying, okay, integrate from 0 to 1. That's I was in brackets translated into bounds. Okay? Of this one over there. So that is x smaller than uh, y less than x plus 1. Sometimes I get stuck in these derivations. And then I need to peek on my notes, but I should be able to do it. Now, how can we calculate that one? So, depending on the y, um, I get different things here. So, suppose now my, okay, my y is between 0 and 1, okay? So, let's first consider the case that the y is less than 1, okay? So that's my first case. And then let's go on with the calculation. That basically means um, the x is less than or equal to y, and the y is smaller than 1, so it's the same as saying I'm integrating from 0 to y. OK? Because for all other cases, the thing is 0. Yeah? Does it make sense? No? So. I'm integrating over a statement which should be true, otherwise it's zero. So I can ignore every, every area where this is zero. And this thing will be zero if the x is larger than the y, okay? So it only produces a one if x is less than y. And so the y is less than one, so it, it makes the integration smaller. And if that's the case, I'm really having here the constant one dx, okay? Let's take the um, inverse derivative of 1, which is just uh, x. And we have these bounds y and 0, and so it will be equal to y. OK. Fine. Actually, when we look at the graph, um, that's already, I mean, let's, let's turn it around. So let's say this is y. And we said this is a half, and this is one, and this is zero. Um, so the part that we, ah, oh, no, no, this is one, and this is two. So the part that I just computed was for zero between one and zero. That's this interval. And this is exactly the function y. OK, great. So let's take the next one. So that's one less than or equal to y less than or equal to two. And this is the case distinction, right? I know you know how to read this. So in way, here's a big bracket and an equal sign to the previous one, and then it's either that way or that one. OK, let's again think about it. So if 1 less than or equal to y less than or equal to uh, 2, so what can we say in that case? So we say up here that y is less than or equal to x plus 1. So that is the same as saying x is um, greater than y minus 1. Okay? So that means that's the same as the integration from y minus 1 until 1. Again, there's some weirdness here, right? But um, if the y is between those, then of course the first statement is always true. The x is anyway only between 0 and 1. So the first statement I can remove. OK? So only the second statement is interesting. And I want to have an expression that tells me something about x. That's where I bring the 1 to the other side. And so I have y minus 1 less than or equal to x. And if that's, that, again, fits nicely as a 2, right? Because 2 is too large anyway. It's not a bound for the x. But if I say y minus 1, then suddenly I'm again in an interesting area. OK, so that one. And again, integrate against the 1. So the Stammfunktion or inverse derivative is just x. And I need to plug in um, the bounds 1 and y minus 1. Okay? 
So if I do that, I get a one minus, plugging this thing in is minus plus one, which is two minus y. Okay? Let's look at our picture and what is this function? It is two minus y, right? So here's the two. And so it's exactly this. The minus says it's going downward and the, for y equals zero, I get a two. Okay, so far so good. Great, so what did we derive? We derived p of y is the following function. So on the interval over here, so for zero less than or equal to y one, the result is y, plus on the interval one less than or equal to y one two, the whole thing is two minus y. Wow, when I saw this the first time, right? I, I came up with this example from, it was in some of the paper from these guys from Tübingen, but they didn't do this calculation and I just wanted to figure out, so now can I derive the density? And I was surprised how complicated it gets already for such a simple example to derive that, right? Great, so we derived our P of Y. Next, we need to derive the P of X given y. Okay? And um, that one gets even more complicated. And I don't show it now. Okay? Let's go back to the slides. I won't show you everything. Um, still, this function is kind of more complicated than the stuff that we have on the board. So our Density was this nice triangle thing. Now, where does the square root come from, right? Um, recall that what I'm trying to derive here is a mapping from the uniform distribution NY to my distribution Y, okay? So given my density that I just derived, how can I get this mapping? And we had that in our transformation classes, how to get it. First, calculate the uh, cumulative distribution function and then invert it to get the quantile function. So what we've written down here is the quantile function, okay? And that one I show you again how to derive it on the board, okay? So I show you now how to derive this, um, yeah, this, why the square root is popping up there, okay? And maybe we also find that I made a mistake on the slides, but let's see. So we could do this as well and you need it for the second line to get like the expression for the x. But we are first only interested in the first one, in the, in the one for the y, and that is already difficult enough. Because the, our next step is, oh, this is really not nice, I want to have a chalkboard. So, um, we need to calculate the CDF for y, okay? So what is it? It is f sub y of little y, and it is the integration of minus infinity y p of y prime y prime. Okay, I put a, a prime here because the y is the, the bound here and then this is a different variable. Okay, plugging everything in. First notice, integration is a linear operator, so integration of a summation is the same as the integral of the first one and integral of the second one. Okay, so let's keep that s separate. Okay, let's first have the, this summation down here. So it's minus infinity to y of the Ivan bracket, zero less than y, less than one, this one, times y, okay? So that is just using the first piece here of my density. Okay, I hope this won't be an exercise because you are copying everything and then but okay, everyone who's copied, if, if you copied it nicely, then feel free to distribute it to the others. Mm -hmm. No problem. Um, okay, now I need to be careful. So this is the y prime, of course, right? So they have different, they should have different names. So again, some thinking, I would brackets nicely translate into bounds for the integration, right? Because it's zero everywhere else. So I can also say, um, this is the integration from zero, up to y or up to 1. So it's a minimum 
of y and y. Yeah, whatever is smaller. Of the function y prime. E y prime. Okay, let's continue with that one. Uh, let's again find the inverse derivative of that one. I think it's a half y squared and it's y prime squared. Okay? And I plug in the minimum and the zero. So if I do this, am I doing it right? Let me just check my, my notes. I, we need to do what? This one. Oh yeah, we, we omitted it. We, we first deal with the first part, and then we do the integration of the second one. Um, I think um, in this case now, since we are, um, ah, okay, I see. Ah, oh, did I did I take a shortcut? Um, yes, I did take a shortcut. So again, let me um, assume for now. We assume for now that y is in this interval. Otherwise, it's order. So let's only consider the case. Okay, my writing gets more and more messed up on the board. Okay, so that was the. using these boards for writing or <laughs> okay so far so correct yeah and now again we need to make this case distinction we say okay let's say our y the one that we plug in here is between zero and one and then the calculation gets easier okay because then we could say okay then I can replace this integration here from 0 to y. Okay, because the y prime can never be smaller than 0, so I can ignore everything up to minus infinity. So the integration goes from 0 to y. The y is something in here, so it is actually um, so the y prime will be never larger than 1, so I can just omit this constraint here because the upper bound is always less than or equal to 1. Okay? So we're just disappearing and I'm getting a simpler expression. So this is simpler now. This is better. Okay? So and, and now again I'm calculating Stammfunktion and blah blah blah, which is y prime squared and I plug in the y and the 0 and this is just a half y squared. Okay. Interesting. Um, I need to invert this to get the quantile function, right? So let's do that one. So let's say this is equal to some uniformly distributed random number, so some u, okay, between 0 and 1. And then that basically means that my quantile function for y of u is equal to, moves the 2 to the other side, takes the square root, square root of 2 times the uniform distributed. And that was the first part of the transformation that I showed you. Let me show you the second one. The second one is um, a bit uh, less nice. It's a bit more involved. So can I raise with this one over here? I, uh, it's amazing. I will ask for one of black boards. Next time. By the way, the difficulty in these calculations, why they take time, is not because the integrals are, are so fancy in this case, the integrals are really easy. It's just all these um, algorithmic <coughs> business over here that requires some thinking, right? So let's take the second case, and let me see whether what I can squeeze down here. So that was one case. Let's take the case where the y is in the interval from 1 to 2, OK? And somehow, of course, we can al already guesstimate what it is. So this is basically a squared function 
Meaning, if you integrate here from over the thing, then you get a squared function. That's just how it is, right? And similarly, now here, we would guess something else the other way around. But to derive the exact expression, it requires some shuffling around of these terms. So let's try it. So it will be the integral from minus infinity to y. Um, y prime is in this interval. Ah, now we are in a different situation. Now we are in this case. Great. So we have the second part of the integration. So it will be 1 less than or equal to y prime, less than or equal to 2. And then 2 minus y. And let's put the primes. So 2 minus y, d prime. Um, and the summation is going from minus infinity to y. OK, interesting. So first of all, notice uh, I can replace the minus infinity with the 1. right? I can never be smaller than 1. OK, great. Uh, let me just do that. Uh, okay. And the other thing is, now I need more thinking. So the y is between those two. So the second condition is always fulfilled, because my y is in this interval. So the y will be always less than or equal to 2, so I can omit it. So now I'm having the integration from 1 to y of the function 2 minus y prime. Again, I can calculate the Stammfunktion, which is then, in this case, having a constant function. I think I need to add some y prime in here, and times the 1 minus a half y prime squared. And I need to evaluate it at y and 1. OK? So let's do that. So at y evaluated, I have 2y minus a half y squared. And if I plug in a 1, I get a 2 minus the half, which is like plus 3 half. OK, great. And this is my uniform distributed variable, OK, for my distribution function. Solve this for y. And then we have our expression. So let's try that. So first of all, um, let's multiply the whole equation with minus 2. OK, if I multiply it with minus 2, I have y squared minus 4y minus 3. And this is a minus 2u, which I bring to the other side. So it's plus 2 times u, being equal to 0. And now you can use your PQ formula. Do you know the PQ formula? So I write it down for you. That just if you have such a squared, such a parabola, then the solutions are minus p half plus minus square root of p half squared minus q. I think this is correct. Is it correct? Yeah, thank you. OK, so let's do it here. Then that means that the y is equal to minus p half is that one, which is equal to 2, I think. Yes, it is. Plus minus square root of 2 squared, which is 4. And then minus the q, so it's plus 3 minus 2u. Is that right? Yeah, it looks right. OK, uh, there must be some sign error in here. Uh, whatever. OK, whatever. There might be a mistake in here. Now I know that the y is less than or equal to 2. Yeah. So I don't need the plus, right? The plus will make it even larger than 2, because the square root is a positive number. So I know it's 2 minus some square root. And in this case, it's uh, 7 minus 2 u. OK? OK, great. This is my transformation formula. Take a uniform distribution, push it through this formula, and the density will be this triangle that goes down. And this is something we try now. 
So the formula looks even different from the one on my slides. But let's compare it, how different it really is. I think approximately it's the same thing. Oh no, and during all this derivation, unfortunately, I didn't switch. So here's the great derivation for everyone. Please press the stop button now, and then you can see it. So there must be an advantage of sitting here in the room, right? And there is an advantage of sitting in the room. Okay. okay. So um, we checked the first part. So that was like the square root of 2u. Take a uniform distribution times 2 and take the square root. Then you get this triangular shape distribution. And the other one, so that's for the first half of your uniform distribution. For the second half of your uniform distribution, you say 2 minus square root of 2 minus 2, blah, blah. Okay? Um, let's check that. Let's check the first expression here. Let's take a uniform distribution and let's take the square root of all the values and look at the histogram. Okay? It should look like a triangle. And that's exactly what I did already here. So I'm generating here my uniformly distributed random variable, 10,000 data points. The histogram looks nice and uniform. And if I then take the histogram of the square root of that one, I get a nice triangle. Okay? That's kind of weird somehow, right? Because um, the uniform distribution gets, how does the square root turn this into such a nice triangle thing? The reason is kind of, the, um, the square root, what it's doing is, um, okay, I need to switch. The square root is doing, doing this one. So it's kind of um, saying, so the, the points at the beginning, they are spread out over a larger interval, right? So if you take a small interval next to zero, it will get spread out on your output, okay? So if this is the n input and this is the square root of n, yeah, then this thing gets spread out, okay? And the further you go here, the less it's spread out. And that's why it's doing just the right thing. Whoa. Okay. So it's surprisingly complicated and you can imagine that that's a nice exercise I'm not sure whether we are doing it with you but to calculate the P of X given Y yeah similarly to deriving the P of Y we can also derive the P of X given Y and then derive and then calculate the CDF of the conditional distribution and then invert it and solve for the for the X okay it's a fun exercise and surprisingly complicated, right? even that we start with so simple distributions. In particular, it kind of hints to the fact that no one would ever do it that way, right? So it's just too complicated to do this. By the way, if you plot this function here, you get a, nicely, um, a nice function, which um, looks like this. Um, so first of all, I think if this is y from 0, 1 to 2, oh no, no, the other way around. So this is my uniform distribution. Uniform distribution, and this is my y, okay? Then first, it's doing that, and then it's doing it the other way around. Those are the two pieces. This is the first square root of two, the noise variable, and this is the constant minus square root of constant minus the other noise variable. And um, if you start with uniform distribution down here, you will get a nice triangular shaped distribution over there. Okay? Good. And this one looks way more complicated, and it really is. It is more complicated. Here's the derivation, the steps. So first write down the joint distribution, then derive the P of Y using the summation rule, then derive the P of X given Y, 
How do you get that one? You divide the joint distribution by P of Y, just using the definition, and then you get an expression for the conditional distribution. And then you derive the CDFs for Y and the CDF for X given Y and solve it for the other way around. And you see, as soon as, as, as things get a little bit more complicated than that, I guess the derivation gets really hairy and you can't do it anymore in closed form solution. So only in this simple case you can do it and it gets already horrible. So now here, what did we do? How did we start? Actually, this was our structural causal model number one, okay? And it was an easy description. You have a uniform distribution, and then you have another uniform distribution, and you sum both up. Here's the other way around. is a quite complicated function and a quite complicated function for x. So somehow, the description of the first um, structural causal model is much nicer than the second one, even though both have exactly the same joint distribution. So both lead to exactly the same joint distribution. Okay? Um, yes, in both cases they are the same. Okay, so far so good. So we have two structural causal models, this one and the other one, and they have a single joint PDF. That's the story. So the structural causal models contain enough information to distinguish the two cases, that one is the cause, the other one is the effect. The joint distribution is not, right? Because this is a joint distribution of two very different situations. Okay? So and this is a nice plot from uh, the book from Jonas Peters. Basically, there's a probabilistic world where we have probabilistic models, so that's like having a joint distribution. And we can say something about outcomes when you sample again, right? You can say something about the mean or the variance or something like that. And also if you have observations, by using statistical learning, I can infer the parameter of my pr probabilistic models. However, more general is the causal model. And the causal model is like more, uh, it's, it's subsuming the probabilistic model. So it can do everything that you can down here, but additionally, you can now also have other things, interventions and even counterfactuals, which we introduce next, okay? So what have you learned so far? Uh, you've learned that a structural causal model um, is giving us some recipe, like a generative model type of description of two random variables, right? How can we generate them? And um, of course, they induce two uh, they induce a joint distribution as well, but the joint distribution is not the starting point. But the starting point are the noise distributions and two mechanisms. And then they induce a joint distribution. However, there is a different structural causal model, the other way around, that can be typically also derived, which has the same joint distribution, but which has very different mechanisms. Okay? And as an example, I showed you this painful derivation of a, a case where we have the same joint distribution, but different structural causal models. So this is using the identity function and just plus, and this one is using square root and some other weird things to do the calculations. However, this is also a structural causal model for y error x. Okay, so both give rise to the same joint distribution. Okay, so far so good. So now the, the promise is, however, with the structural causal model, you can do more. So let's do more with it. And the more you can do are interventions. And I briefly explained already what I meant by this, basically changing something and then having a say about what the resulting distributions are. So um, let me change the lighting again. So now I'm super dark. Maybe better, maybe not. So why is it so bad? Because it's dark outside. Yeah, whatever. It's not getting better. Okay, intervention. So let's start with that one. So let's say we have a structural causal model, the one that we are talking about the whole time. An intervention now is defined to be a modification of my structural causal model where we replace one of the assignments with a different assignment. Okay, so that's the thing. We could either have a hard intervention. A hard intervention is replacing a super interesting mechanism that does some interesting calculation with a constant, okay? Just saying, what happens if I put the number four in here? What happens to the other distributions? 
And a soft intervention is replacing it with a different mechanism that is possibly also random. Okay, so there's a hard replacement or a hard intervention and a soft intervention. Okay, and this is only exemplarily, so we could replace the effect statement, but we could, of course, also the assignment for the C could be also replaced. So now let's introduce some notation. So starting with the structural causal model M, yeah, applying the intervention that E sets E set to four creates a new structural causal model which is induced from my old one because everything stays the same yeah the noise distribution stays the same the assignments that I'm not replacing also stays the same I'm only replacing one thing so this is like having a computer program for M and just changing one line of code and this is giving you a new way to generate numbers okay and this is called an intervention so we could either write it like that we could have the M and take an exponent and say what we did, how we modified it. Um, we could write the joint distribution of C and E now in such a way that we put the do thing up here to the exponent and the do thing means I changed something. Um, I could also omit the M, this is just notation. So this is the ECI notation, so the notation from the book. However, Perl and many others, they use this notation that they say we condition on the fact that there's this do expression behind. However, that is not really a condition, but it's really modifying the distribution. Yeah, another way to write it is P of C given do E equals four. And the difference here now is this is not about observing that E has a particular value, but this is about setting E to a particular value and then seeing what's happening, okay? So let's do some example here. So here are two um, noise variables, and let's say in this case now they are Gaussian distributed and independent of each other, and we say the cause is the first Gaussian distribution, and the effect is four times the cause plus some more noise, okay? So the causal graph is again C error E, okay? And of course, um, Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. So this is the, the usual notation for the Gaussian distribution with mu and sigma, or mu and sigma squared typically. Okay, sometimes I also write it with x semicolon mu and sigma, if I particularly want to say what uh, variable I'm talking about. Um, now let's look at an intervention. So suppose I'm intervening on the cause, okay? Then this will have an effect on the effect. So what do I mean by this? So, um, Let's say now I'm, I'm replacing, uh, let's first look at the distribution of the E. So the distribution of the E, what is the mean of E? So since the C has mean zero, and then I'm applying four times something with mean zero plus another variable with mean zero, the overall mean of E will be zero as well. So that's why I've written here a zero. What about the variance? The variance changes according to my transformation formula, and the transformation formula will tell me that for the covariance, I need to square the scaling and plus the other variance. So that follows from the transformation formula. So the variance of my effect is 17, okay? That's just following from the equations up here. Now suppose I'm modifying my variable C and replacing the randomness over here, and let's replace it with a constant of two. That means my mean is now changed, and now my mean is 8, because I have 4 times C is equal to 8, plus a Gaussian distribution. And the only randomness here that remains is the noise of the effect. Okay, so by setting this thing up here, I'm modifying my distribution. And of course, I can also set a different value, and I will get a different distribution. Okay? So my structural causal model that I began with is not only telling me something about joint distribution, but it's also telling me something about distributions that I get if I slightly make small modifications to the setup, slightly modifying the assignments. Not all of them, but only one. And that's, I that's exactly what you do when you do a, a randomized experiment, right? So um, uh, let's say there's a treatment and Patients, some patients get it, some don't, and they, they might be, the doctors might have some clue, maybe patients with some bigger problems, they get treatment A, patients with smaller problems get treatment B, so there might be some complicated mechanism, and you can look at 
some big table of outcomes, how well it works. It's very hard to say from that data whether the treatment was good or not. Because if you apply treatment A only to the tough cases, then maybe it might be beneficial, but overall the outcome is considered to be bad, right? Because like the, the sample wasn't random. However, if you flip a coin for each patient, no matter whether it's a hard case or an easy case, to decide on the treatment. So if you randomize that variable, that's a sort of intervention to randomize it. You change the mechanism, how you decide on the value, then you can really measure something about the cause. Okay, so you put an um, intervention in that and that tells you something about the P of outcome given the treatment, uh, given do of the treatment. Okay, so far so good. Um, notice here, by the way, if we change the cause, yeah, the distribution that we get is the same as the condition distribution. So actually here not much happened. Yeah? So the, the probability of applying an uh, intervention on the cause is not really doing much. Yeah? The effect variable is the same as it would have been if we would have conditioned on the cause. However, this is of course different if I now intervene on the effect. If I intervene on the effect, let's see what's happening to my cause variable. So my cause variable is standard normal. And if I set my assignment for the E, if I replace it with setting it to 2 or setting it to 3, the distribution for the C is not changing, right? Because the E is not at all influencing the C. So the, the, the E is not part of the assignment for the C. And there you see the, that it's not symmetric. And in this case, the distributions are not equal to the case where I condition on the statement E being equal to 2 or E being equal to 3. Okay? So now, by having a structural causal model, we introduce some asymmetry here between things that are at the beginning of an error and things that have an error going in. Okay? And the difference comes to light when we apply an intervention to our situation. Okay? So now, it's just a mathematical description of what we typically do when we randomize an experiment and we randomize a variable and we want to see whether the observed distribution is changing or not. If the distribution is not changing, yeah, then um, the randomized variable does not have an effect. Uh, it's not the cause of the effect that I want to observe. Okay? If the distribution is changing, then I know, yes, there's a causal, there's a causal thing between them. Of course, if I cannot do um, something like an intervention, then it's very hard to find causal relationships. However, if, as we will see during the lecture, it's sometimes possible too. Okay, so here's a summary. So this is my structural causal model, okay? And if I intervene on the cause, yeah, it will change the distribution of the effect, and it changes it in such a way that it's just the same as if I would have conditioned on it. However, if I change the effect, I'm, the, the distribution is not changing as in the first case, and in particular, this one is not the same as conditioning. So if we only talk about joint distributions, we are in this conditioning world, and that's all we can say. And if we are in a causal model world, we can also talk about what happens if I intervene on variables, okay? We can now mathematically describe it. And this is now creating an asymmetry be between cause and effect, which is interesting to think about. Good. Um, here's an other, another interesting observation. Um, now let's do the randomization. Uh, suppose we randomize the effect by giving it a new distribution. So we're replacing the assignment which was using the C and let's replace it that we just say, okay, it's just a noise variable. So that is the randomization and the outcome will be that now the cause and the effect are statistically independent. Right? Which makes sense. Ca it's kind of the error is gone. Um, and that basically means okay, the effect has no causal influence on the cause. If we do it the other way around, if I randomize the cause, yeah, in that case, um, they are still dependent. And so the cause is still dependent on the effect. So this one does not imply that they are independent of each other, but they stay dependent. And this will give me some hint that the C might be a cause of the effect. Okay? And this is like the simplest possible setup. Um, another way to talk about it is um, 
to distinguish condition and intervention is to, con to distinguish seeing and doing, okay? So conditioning is like seeing. So I have a big data set. I cannot collect more data. I just have my big Excel sheet and I can look at it. I can observe it. I cannot influence the way the data was generated. So I'm not an experimental physicist who can manipulate the experiment. I can only observe. That is in particular, that's the situation of astrophysics, right? In astrophysics, um, you are looking at the sky and you cannot do any manipulation. You can only observe joint distributions. Yeah? You cannot do causal experiments. Maybe you can run a rocket and let it bump into some um, asteroid that is close by, but that's it, right? That's it. You can only describe everything with conditional distributions. However, a particle physicist, they do interventions, right? They say, so what happens if I let this particle hit the other one? And then they can repeat it over and over and over, randomize some conditions, and by that learn something about the causal structure in particle physics. So that's quite interesting. So that in astronomy and astrophysics, you're only observing, and in particle physics, you can do interventions, okay? Okay, so again, in the we have a joint distribution, okay? Uh, the joint distribution is inferring, is inducing various distributions of our y, yeah? the marginal distribution, which is like averaging out the x, or some interesting observer, ob observational distribution where I say, I'm interested in the cases where x was equal to 1. What's the distribution of y? So for example, x being equal to female. So what is the distribution of y of income? x being equal to main. What is the distribution of y of income or something? So that is all um, seeing. Um, however, it doesn't tell us if I change any of these variables, if I manipulate the setup, if I randomize treatment or not, then the joint distributionist doesn't tell me anything. However, in that case, my structural causal model is not only introducing a joint distribution, but it's also telling me something about the interventional distributions, which are the ones where I put the do operator over here. Okay? And those are now new, dis new distributions which go beyond the joint distribution. It's not in the joint distribution. And these, they tell you something about cause and effect, okay? So that's the big deal about conditioning versus intervention. So far so good? Okay, let's go one step further. So there will be a hierarchy and the lowest step on the ladder is seeing, um, asking the question, um, yeah, what can we observe? The second step on the ladder are interventions, like doing something, asking the question, what will happen if I do this? And the third step on the ladder will be counterfactuals. And they ask the question, what would have happened if I did things differently? So you first have an observation, and then you say, okay, too bad, that was my observation, the patient is blind or dead or whatever. I want to answer the question, what would have happened if I did the other treatment? And that can be also described with structural causal models, which is, I think, quite fantastic. So that's quite, quite amazing that you can talk about it mathematically in a precise manner. Counterfactual, so that's the first difficulty of counterfactual is, what at all is the counterfactual? So what is it philosophically? So it's a concept from philosophy and there were philosophers writing books on these things of counterfactual. So, uh, counterfactual conditional, first of all. Uh, counterfactual is short for counterfactual conditional. And a conditional is something like an if then else statement, right? Or an implication. And a counterfactual condition is a conditional with a wrong if clause. Okay? So it's something where the antecedent is wrong. Okay? And we want to say something about probabilities of un something with a wrong antecedent. In logic, if you have a wrong antecedent, the statement is always true, right? Ex falso quod libet. So from something false, anything follows. Um, we want to put probabilities to these statements, which is, I think, quite, quite cool if you can do it. Here's the counterfactual statement. If 2 plus 3 is equal to 6, then 2 times 2 plus 3 is equal to 12. Okay. I mean, it's a valid mathematical statement because the antecedent is wrong, right? But in a way, it also makes sense to say, um, if I say 2 plus 3 is equal to 6, then it would, would make sense to say 2 times 2 plus 3 is equal to 20, right? So that's kind of garbage. 
However, mathematically speaking, both are true, right? But like if you think about it more from a plausibility point of view, one is more reasonable than the other. Here's another one. If cars were flying, then there would be no traffic jam. It's also a counterfactual statement, okay? We don't know it for sure, but it kind of makes sense. There are nice Wikipedia pages. I'm a big fan of Wikipedia page pages, so of course you have to read them and you have to think about yourself, but in, in particular the math and computer science department, they are really nice. Also the philosophy department, I think it's quite good, at least from my, lay, from my layman's perspective, okay? And there's so this also in German, kontrafaktisches Konditional. Okay, fine. You can look it up. So this counterfactual conditional is also called sometimes counterfactual. Here's another one. So the counterfactuals allow us to answer questions that are counter to the fact, so that are in contradiction to what we observe. And that's what makes them so interesting. So like this one, the mass one, um, the traffic jam one, and there's also some in poker. I, I don't know whether you like playing poker, Texas Hold'em or something. Recently, um, AI was not only winning against the chess champion or against the Go champion, but they won also in Texas Hold Hold'em against human champions. So also in poker now, the best player is in artificial intelligence. And they use counterfactual regret minimization, so which is some fancy something from machine learning. But um, it is sometimes useful in a poker game to assume something which is different from your observation and then evaluate that. So it happened in poker games. So let's say what would have happened if I would have done blah, 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 blah. Sometimes it's important to evaluate your current situation, in particular because of bluffing and these kind of things. So sometimes it's interesting to have these statements. And uh, of course, here's the link. So have a look at counterfactual regret minimization for the poker AI it's done. Just look at it and appreciate it that there's some nice mathematics and maybe it motivates you to learn more, right? Or maybe you're already super clever and you understand it right away. Why not? Okay, so it's super, super important, these things. Um, there's a book from David Lewis from 1970. It's called Counterfactuals. It's a philosophy book. I have it on my bookshelf, of course, but mm, I haven't used it so much, right? There are not so many equations in there, so it's a lot of text. Um, but it's, a, it's already a topic for a long time. So counterfactuals is something really non-trivial. Um, the more amazing is it that you can model it mathematically, right? Okay, how can we define them now mathematically? How can we really nail it down? Of course, the assumption of having a structural causal model is a big assumption, right? It's saying we have a generative model of the data. That's a lot. However, if we have a generative model, then we can nail down also counterfactual statements. So let's try to formalize it. Suppose we have the structural causal model that we've seen before. It's the same one as before. Now we say a counterfactual model results from a given structural causal model after changing the noise distributions. That's it. You just change the noise distribution. So now how do you change them? Typically, we replace the noise distribution with something like the noise distribution now conditioned on some observations. So we are having some facts, some observations, that's our data, and having seen the data, this will influence the noise distributions, right? The noise distributions are, at the beginning, completely uninformed, generating us a new data point. However, now we have our new data point, this should tell us something about the noise distributions, right? I mean, the variable, the cause, for example, up here is just a nonlinear transformation of my noise distribution. So if I observe a cause variable, true or false, or a number or whatever, of course I can say something about my noise distribution. Similarly here, even if I only see the effect and I keep the C random, I can also say something about the noise distribution, right? So they are kind of coupled, at least conditionally. Okay. So suppose I'm observing that my cause has a particular value and my data was generated by a structural causal model M, then we would say now we get a new structural causal model that we write like this. We say M conditioned on my observation, okay? And I get a new joint. However, this is not a joint, this is a marginal. No, the, the joint should, should be, now I also have a new C in here, okay? So I need to correct the slide. So this defines me a new distribution for C and for E, okay? So why is that the case? 
Uh, let's look at the board. Um, again, let's draw our picture that we had. We had the noise distribution over here, which was influencing my cause. Um, and I have another noise distribution over here for the effect. By the way, the noise distribution is not really driving that one. The noise distribution is just uh, collecting everything that is random about E. And the, the functions down here are collecting everything that is deterministic about E. Okay? So if there's some randomness in here, it typically comes from, from here, some observational, or not observational, but some randomness. Okay, and similarly I have that one. So, and now I said, okay, great, we have data. Okay, here's my data, and my data is now, my variable C has been observed to be 17. Okay, then I can modify now, so this is my structural causal model M, and now I can modify it with this observation. First of all, the old one um, was P of N, E, and N, C, or somehow given, typically it's uh, factorizing into dif different distributions. Typically they are assumed to be independent. But let's write it more generally. And now after I've seen my data, I have a new distribution. I take the one that is conditioned on my observation. So why is it manipulating these distributions? Okay, but very classically I can plug in the 17 in here, okay, and this is telling me something about the noise distribution over here, right? So if I observe the C, it will change the distribution of that one. And it could even couple them. So even if they are independent up here, after the observation, somehow they could be now dependent on each other. So that can happen too. And so now my manipulated model, so that is the old one, and the one that is manipulated is now written as this m to the power of c equals 17. And this model is the same structural causal model, having the same assignment over here, but replacing the distribution for the noise with my new noise distribution. Okay, now you see already where it's getting. So um, notice this model here will also induce some distribution of C and E, some joint distribution. Yeah? Even though we have, but there was a C was equal to 17. But this knowledge is only put into the distribution of the noise, and then the overall model, again, is giving us a joint distribution, where we now would, I don't know how to write it exactly, I don't know, maybe something like this. Notation is not important. This is not a manipulated one. And here we had another joint distribution without the um, observation, OK? So the whole idea of these causal models is you have these different pieces to it, the assignments and the distribution. And with an intervention, I replace one of those, but keep all the rest. And then the structural causal model tells me everything about the rest combined with my intervention. If I have an observation, some facts here, I can also manipulate my model in a clever way, but keep the mechanisms down here. Don't change everything, okay? Okay, so far so good. Um, you want to see something? Okay, so that is the notation that, that one can use here. And it's a joint distribution for C and E. Okay, so it's a new distribution for both. Um, now, a counterfactual question is the combination of this new distribution with an intervention. So, what is the distribution in my counterfactual model where I have observed that capital C was equal to little c? If I now set c to a different value, what is the distribution of E? And so that is basically now um, mathematically capturing a counterfactual statement. So my fact is that variable C was 17, and I want to see, so that is my data, which I now have, and it's changing my noise distribution. And now I want to make a statement, what is the probability if I 
would set it to a different value. Okay, and since um, the counterfactual distribution uh, model here is really just another structural causal model, of course I can also ask questions with the do operator here. Okay, so far so confusing. Of course, let's look into an example here. So here's an example with some numbers and with some distributions to get our hands on some, some, some real world something. So here's some eye disease story, okay? So suppose there are patients with some eye disease. Um, there are two possible treatments and the treatment sometimes cures the disease but sometimes it can have bad side conditions and the side conditions are really bad, you will be blind, okay? So that's the situation. Um, here's a structural causal model um, that describes a similar story kind of, or this story you now probabilistically. So there's a coin flip which decides whether you get the treatment or not, okay? With some parameter, doesn't matter what the number is. And then there's another, so that is basically the random variable whether the treatment gets applied or not. It's even equal, the noise variable is equal to my T treatment variable, okay? So that's why NT and T is the treatment applied variable. It's either one or zero, true or false. And then there's the other, <coughs> excuse me, noise variable, which is like a very unlikely coin. Yeah, It's like a 1% coin. You only see heads in 1% of the cases. And it says in 1% of the cases, you're in the unlucky group. And so now what is the unlucky group? The unlucky group is the persons who turn blind after getting the treatment, okay? So there, are, there could be, for example, a certain genetic condition. And so if you do this particular treatment and the persons with these particular genetic conditions, which is super rare, they turn blind and everyone else is healed and whatever, has some profit from it. So that's the statement. Now what about this formula here? So that's now saying, so suppose you are um, in the lucky group. So that means the noise B is equal to zero. So in 0 0.99 of the cases, um, that means one minus zero is equal to one. In that case, in one minus, oh, this is super confusing. Let me phrase it again. So the T's, you get treatment or not. The other one is unlucky group, yes or not. So suppose you're in the unlucky group. So NB is equal to one. And you receive the treatment. Then you have a one times one. So you will be blind, okay? So that's the first expression over here. Um, if you are not in the unlucky group, you are in the lucky group, so that is the one minus NB. So when NB is equal to zero, you are in the lucky group. So one minus NB is a one. And in that case, you are only blind if you don't get the treatment, okay? So if you are in the lucky group, you have to get the treatment. And if you are in the unlucky group, you better not get the treatment, okay? So that's basically what's in this formula in here. So far, so good. Here comes the counterfactual question. So there comes a patient, gets treated, but then turns blind after a day. So B is equal to 1. T is equal to 1. B is equal to 1. Now the quest counterfactual question is, would the person be blind if he hadn't been treated? Okay? And let's try to calculate this now. By the way, that is very relevant um, to law, right? You remember there was a case in Berlin where like the people from the last generation were gluing themselves on some street and then there was an accident with some bicycle, um, uh, person driving a bicycle and the person died because of the accident. And the story was, so because of the blockade of the street, like the, um, the people who could have saved them from the, um, the firemen or whoever have special equipment could have saved that person. Now the question is, so that those are the facts, the person died. The counterfactual question relevant for law is now, would the person be still alive if the protesters wouldn't have glued themselves onto the street? Okay, that's a typical counterfactual statement which is super relevant. And actually that's something that they try to answer, okay? And here we have the mathematical version of that one to really put numbers to that one. If you assume a certain model, for what's the likelihood that the person gets saved and blah, 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 under certain conditions, then you can calculate these numbers, right? Which is quite interesting. Anyway, this is not so, it's, it's drastic as well because you turn blind in this story. So here's the question is, the person who turned blind after the treatment, would they be blind if they hadn't been treated? And this can be answered now 
under the assumption that we have the structural causal model, okay? So let's do that. So this is our initial structural causal model, just copied from the previous slide. So the question is, would the pi person be blind if he or she hadn't been treated? Let's first modify our structural causal model with our observation. So observations are the treatment is equal to 1 and the person is blind. Okay, so that is our data. <coughs> now by looking at these equations, we see that if t is equal to 1 um, and b is equal to 1, it implies that the person was in the unlucky group, right? Because t times... Um, um, just a second. Oh yeah, b was equal to 1 and t was equal to 1, so that the second term is equal to 0 because 1 minus t is equal to 0, so the first term must be equal to 1, and it's only 1 if the nb is also equal to 1. Okay? Of course, we can also say something about the nt. The nt was, is also equal to 1, but that's not surprising because there we have the identity. So from this observation, we can, op we can learn something about the noise distribution for this particular person, for this particular instance, right? So the person entering um, the hospital is like a random sample and we know nothing about it, but after treatment and the person turns blind, we know something about it, about the unobservable variables here. So in this case, we know uh, the person is from the unlucky group. Okay, thus, what can we do with it? We can rewrite our model now, like this where we just plug in the one in here. Okay, and now we can calculate for the remainder here that if nb is equal to 1, um, then if the person didn't uh, got get the treatment, now we have to do a calculation. Uh, ah, okay. No, no, it's simpler. So we plug in the nb equals 1 into this first expression. So we have t times 1 plus 0. So I'm just saying now the blind is exactly equal to the variable t for the case nb equals 1. That's what I'm saying. Okay? So this thing is now defining a new joint distribution over the blind and the ab about t and b. And we can again ask questions. What happens if we do t equals 1? And we can query the question with an intervention here. And we see that the b is equal to the t. So what we did is we only modified the noise distributions in this case. Okay, so far so good. Thus, now we can compute in this model. The difficulty is just the notation. So in the counterfactual model where we have a new noise distribution, we apply the treatment with an intervention and then can calculate the probability that the person is not blind. And the probability will be equal to 1. Okay? And it is encoded in our structural causal model and you have no chance to do this with the joint distribution, if that is what you're modeling about the world, okay? Okay, so far so good. Um, on the other hand, if another next random person enters the hospital, and so the doctor, she doesn't know whether the person is the unlucky group or the lucky group, okay, then in our initial model, the probability of applying the treatment will be that the person, um, yeah, does not turn blind is only 1%. So the other way around, if I don't apply the treatment to a random person, with 99%, the person will turn blind. Okay? So, like, for the doctor, of course, it kind of makes sense to do that, but it's better if they were be able to have a test before whether the person is in the unlucky group or not. Okay? However, the point of all this is that um, the structural causal model is allowing us to express mathematically what a counterfactual statement should, what probability we should assign to counterfactual statements. Okay? So that's the, the whole story here. So there are three steps to get to a counterfactual statement. We start with some initial structural causal model, for example, for two variables x and y. Okay? Before they were called c and e, let's call them x and y. And now suppose we have some observation, we observe little x for capital X. Now the question would be, for example, what would have been the probability of y being equal to y if we set x now to an even different value? So counter to the fact that we observed a little x, set it to any value, and we are interested in the distribution of the y. Okay, so that is our counterfactual question. 
We do three steps. The first is also called abduction. Basically, it's replacing the noise variables in my structural causal model now with the conditional noise variables. So where I conditioned on the facts. Okay, so that's the first step. So this is now creating a counterfactual model. And um, note that the joint of the noise variables might not factorize anymore. So s they can become coupled suddenly, okay? The second step is action. So we modify our model now by setting one of the assignments with our do operator to some particular va value. So that is an intervention. By this, we are changing the course of history, yeah, if we want to say so. So the abduction is changing the noise variables of our model, and the action is changing the, in uh, the, the assignments. So this modifies our counterfactual model with an intervention. And finally, then, we have a new structural causal model from which we can now calculate probabilities, just prediction, okay? So we have these three steps, abduction, action, and predictions that allow us to compute counterfactual statements. Okay, so far so good. Um, there are different ways to modify structural causal models that we've seen, okay? I'm already, are you having a direct question to the counterfactuals before I start with the summary? No, not so far, okay. So there are different ways to modify a structural causal model. The one was we can replace assignments those are called interventions. And the other one is we replace the noise distributions and then intervene additionally. And those are called counterfactuals. Um, you can also view counterfactuals as interventions on a counterfactual structural causal model. But the wording is non-ideal, I think. I think one could improve the wording a little bit. Yeah? The, more, the more I think about it, so this is already several iterations that I gave the lectures. And it looks like there are two things to modify a uh, joint distribution. One is conditioning. This is like putting observations. And the other is putting a do statement in there. So if you have a structural causal models. And there are these two things that you can do. You can apply an action to uh, get an intervention, or you can do a condition. And by combining both, you get a counterfactual, right? So that's a combination of having an observation and doing an action. However, it only works if you have these noise distributions. If you directly model X and Y, then you can't do this. Yeah? You have to have these buffer in between where you can store like your observations. Um, now let's get to Perl's causal hierarchy. Okay, so there are observational statements. Okay, did we talk about in the, did you look at the videos of Bayesian networks? No, you didn't, right? So there's an example with some sprinkler. Sprinkler is like Rasenspringer is a sprinkler and there's like a famous sprinkler example in, in, in Perl's books. And so there could be the question, what is the probability that it is winter? So one variable is equal to one, given that I see that the sprinkler is outside. Yeah? So I'm just observing the world like an astrophysicist. Yeah? And then I can have observational statement and I could say something like that with seeing something. Next, I'm a particle physicist, and I can have interventions, okay? So what is the probability that it is winter, given that I do put the sprinkler outside? And here you see the story already. Of course, if the sprinkler is outside, it's probably summer, right? Because you don't sprinkle your lawn in the winter. However, what's happened if I do put my sprinkler inside? Does this really influence whether it's winter or not? Not at all, right? So the do statement does not influence, the do statement about putting a sprinkler outside does not influence basically whether it's summer or winter. Of course, it's more likely that I do it in the summer. But um, of course, if I have an intervention, if I even would flip a coin every day and put the sprinkler outside or not, if I randomize it, it's not changing basically what season we have, okay? So that is the second level. And then there is the third level, which is a combination of conditioning and intervention, and it's even more. So having, having seen that the sprinkler ou is outside, okay, what is this probability that it is winter if we would have put the sprinkler inside? That's a little bit weird and maybe a little bit bogus here, but um, that's basically a translation of, of telling this, continuing the story, right? Of course, if I have seen that the sprinkler is outside, probably it's summer, okay, um, and if I then put the sprinkler inside, it won't change the season, okay? So the story is not, not, so, not so great, but it's like two variables, x and y, and I don't know, I'm out of stories for x and y. 
maybe treatment and um, cure is the best one. So that's where it's very clear something is the cause and the other one is the effect. Okay, so far so good. All this has been invented by Judy Pearl. So he's like uh, a Nobel Prize winner in computer science. So there's no Nobel Prize in computer science. I think there wasn't computer science when Nobel was setting up this competition. And Nobel also didn't set up didn't, didn't set up anything for mathematicians. And I think that was because of some mathematician called Mittag. And I think he had an affair with the wife of Nobel or something. And so the mathematicians don't, there's a story, you can look it up. There's a story why the mathematicians don't get a Nobel Prize. So if you're a mathematician and you want to get the Nobel Prize, you have to get into econometrics. And then you can get one for economy, like Ted Nash or people like him, who are also mathematicians, I think. Anyway, so he got the super prize and um, he developed um, many different things. He's still alive. He has a Twitter account, so you can follow him. He's always browsing the causality litera literature and kind of telling us what are great new papers out there. Or he's also a great educator, educating other people about causality. And so he's a really interesting person, like a very serious person who did some, some, some great contributions to computer science. He, um, just as a little background, so he's also a pioneer in artificial intelligence. So he, in my opinion, he, he wrote three, three big books. Yeah? So the first one is Heuristics. Um, I think it's from the 70s. And it's about search. Search meaning you have a big tree. You want to solve a Sudoku or you want to have a big search tree in chess. And so he has a nice book on heuristics to search efficiently in these big search trees. Okay, so that's like a typical AI questions from the 70s or 60s. And he made a nice, um, uh, a nice book on it. And it's about intelligent search, uh, strategies for computer problem solving. Um, later, uh, in the 80s, um, expert system came into fashion, right? And expert systems are like these big rule-based systems. Maybe you have already talked to an expert system on the website, your printer is not going, and then the first question you get, uh, did you plug in the power plug? Next question, did you switch it on? And you get all these stupid questions. And of course, it would be nicer if you would assign probabilities to these questions. Like, let's say, okay, that the person who is getting to this stupid website doesn't know how to connect the printer is very unlikely. So let's start with some other expert questions and make it more probable. So it's nice if we would have probabilities inside an expert system. However, how to do it right? And for that, um, Julia Pearl developed Bayesian networks, which are basically could be applied to expert systems and assign probability in all the locations in some big directed acyclic graph, which is an expert system. Okay. And he, he wrote a nice book on it. On It's called Probabilistic Reasoning in Intelligent Systems. Um, the, the deceiving thing about Bayesian networks is that they look very causal, right? So the errors, they look very much like I first have that one and then the next one. However, um, we will I think we will have some lecture on Bayesian networks as well. And there you will see you can switch the errors around. You just give, get a different representation for your joint distribution. They are not really causal in Bayesian networks. The Bayesian networks are useful to calculate complicated probability distributions in super large joint distributions. So it's like a marriage of graph theory and probabilities. However, they don't do anything causal. They can be made causal, and typically they are nicer if they have a causal interpretation, but it's actually beyond this book. In the book, of course, he has already chapters on causality in there and causal interpretations. However, it's not well developed. That's the third book, the book called Causality. And that's basically where he extends like Bayesian networks so that they also have a causal interpretation. And so his main contribution here is to bring graphs on the scene so that you draw a graphical model for your causal uh, dependencies. That's something that people in econometrics were not doing. So they were also having very complicated ideas and interesting tricks to infer causal relationships, but they were not drawing graphs. And without graphs and without looking at deseparation and things like that, it's very difficult and a black art to do it right, causality. And so Julia Pearl introduced these graphs and many, many other things that you can read in his, in his books. So he's really um, like a great person. Here you also see some graphical model in the background and um, the, the, he has a website and he has lots of papers on the website. So have a look at it and, and see, look at some of the pioneers 
who developed all of this. Okay, great. So that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. Let's hope that the recording works. And I see you next week.